so if I'm being honest, if there's one thing that I've been struggling with this year, it's getting the plan for my cutting garden written down on paper. Now, most years this isn't the case because in my experience, you know, once you decide on a cutting garden layout, once you go through the process of planning and fully executing on that plan, then every year after that, things get a little bit easier. Because rather than starting from scratch, you're simply adjusting your plan based off the lesson that you learned the previous year. Once you zero in on what works, there's no real reason to stray away from that. And that's why we planted a very similar looking garden the last several years. In fact, it's the same garden layout that I share in our quarter acre garden plan. Sure, we may switch up the colors of the flowers that we grow, maybe swapping our favorite pink zinnias for a more vibrant orange, but the big details, like the specific flower varieties themselves and the quantities which we plant, those things have the tendency to stay the same. This year though, I'm really feeling the pull to do things differently. After five years of growing a cutting garden purely of annuals, I'm finding myself wanting to incorporate a few more perennials into the mix. The newness that comes from a decision like this has me debating all of these nagging what if sort of questions. And quite frankly, it brings me back to the overwhelm that I so vividly remember feeling when I was deciding on what to plant in my very first cutting garden. In case you're in that same boat of not knowing what to plant or how much to plant in your cutting garden, I thought I'd take you through my process of how I basically take a simple bare piece of dirt and transform it into a beautiful cutting garden. Whether you have plants or grow for hobby or you're hoping to build a business around your flower garden, I hope after watching this video, you'll see that designing a cutting garden doesn't have to be an overly stressful process. So if you're ready, let's get started. Now I'm sure you're already fully aware, but there is no right or wrong way to design a cutting garden. The choices you make in regards to your cutting garden will largely depend on the goals that you have for your garden the environment and the climate which you're growing your flowers in, and also your own personal likes and dislikes. There is no cookie cutter plan for what a perfect cutting garden looks like. And I share this not to overwhelm you with even more choices, but more so that you realize that you can't screw this up. Sometimes I think that we just need that little reminder so that we don't overthink this process to the point where we never even get started. So long before you order any seeds or flip through the flower catalogs, the best thing that you can do for yourself is to take inventory of the growing space that you have available. That space, however big it is, will guide many of your decisions down the line, like how many plants you can actually grow. Now, I don't want you to be fooled with this first step. It doesn't take a lot of space to grow armloads of flowers. For most beginner gardeners, a simple three foot by 10 foot piece of ground is all you'll need. Here at Two Sisters, we grow all of our summer annuals on a simple quarter acre plot. That quarter acre includes pathways too, so in reality, our grow space is even less than that. And believe it or not, that quarter acre is enough space for us to grow enough flowers that we can fulfill our summer bouquet subscriptions, as well as allow visitors into our garden on a weekly basis for you pick events. I feel like so many aspiring flower farmers think that space is their most limiting factor. But what I have found to be true is that time is more limiting than space. The big question that I really encourage you to sit and think through before you even get started is how big of a space can you realistically tend to without losing your sanity? Like really think through how much time do you have to devote to this hobby or to devote to your business? The one lesson that I had to learn the hard way and I suspect that many of you will learn it the hard way too, but getting seeds into the ground is often the easy part. It's the weeding, the watering, the fertilizing, the pest control, and the harvesting that takes a good amount of time. And all that effort is something that a lot of us don't take into account, especially when we're feeling, you know, that initial surge of excitement of growing all the pretty flowers. And to really drive home my point, Realize too that a quarter acre space wasn't what we started with initially. It's taken me a number of years of growing to really become efficient enough where a quarter acre was actually doable. As you gain experience and become more proficient at growing flowers, the number of flowers that you're able to grow will naturally increase. So have patience with the process. So now that we're in agreement that you don't need a lot of space to get started, other factors worth considering is how much sun does your space receive on average? 
Most standard catflower varieties require at least six hours of sunlight per day. So it's to your advantage to opt for a spot in your yard that receives plenty of sunlight. In addition to sun, catflowers do best when they receive regular water. You see, annual flowers especially, which are what make up the bulk of most cutting gardens, they don't have particularly deep roots, which means they aren't as tolerant to drought as perennials are with their more developed root systems. Compared to the perennials that you're likely familiar with, the ones that grow within your landscape, a cutting garden will require more consistent watering. Now, in an ideal world, Mother Nature would supply our flowers with all the water they need by way of consistent rainfall. But what I've learned is that we can't always rely on Mother Nature to follow through. And so you should take time during this early planting stage to consider how you'll get water to your plants in the absence of rain. Does your space have access to a water spigot where you can hook up a hose and run an overhead sprinkler? Or is your space close enough to your home where you can manually bring water to your plants with a watering can? For the quarter acre of flowers that we grow here at Two Sisters, I rely on drip tape as an effective and efficient way to irrigate our flower beds. If you're wanting to know more exactly on how I set up our system, I share all the details in this video here, and you're gonna wanna check it out after you're done watching this video. I'll actually link it for you in the description box below. Once you decide on the location, I encourage you to physically measure the perimeter of your grow space. I myself am a very visual person. I like to draw out my garden outline physically on graph paper so I can get a sense for how everything will come together. The next step in this process is to narrow in on the details and plan your garden layout. Now, if you're just getting started and following my suggestion of starting with a three foot by 10 foot garden space, then your garden space will likely consist of a single flower bed. I'll be sure to help you decide on the flowers to include in that bed in the next step of this process, so hang with me. But if you're starting with a slightly larger space, it's important that you think through the layout of your garden so you don't create a headache for yourself later on. Think through your gardening process and try to imagine your space as you progress through the growing season. For instance, you know, consider how you want your garden to flow once your plants are mature and able to be harvested from. Will you set a bucket down at the end of each row and physically walk your flowers to that bucket as you cut from your garden? Or will you pull some sort of garden cart alongside you? Which then begs the question, well, how wide do your garden pathways need to be to be able to accommodate that cart. As I've already shared, we grow flowers here at Two Sisters for the purpose of selling them. And so I approach my garden layout with a business mindset. I look at our garden space and I ask myself questions like, how can I efficiently grow the most amount of flowers possible? So for me, I prefer to design my garden space with as uniform beds as possible. By grouping flowers together in a very uniform manner, it allows me to treat everything the same. And as a result, I can more easily care and tend to my flowers. As you can see from this illustration here, my garden space is longer than it is wide. And while it would be acceptable for me to orientate my beds the width of my garden space, I much prefer to plant everything lengthwise in long, straight rows. Now for the garden beds themselves, I use three foot wide garden beds as my standard for everything that I grow. And that three foot width is purely a personal choice. You see, I love to grow my flowers in beds that are three foot wide as it allows me to easily reach the center of my beds from either side. You can choose any width that you prefer, but I have found that anything beyond four foot wide, it can be difficult to reach your innermost plants. If you're finding it difficult to visualize what I'm talking about, let me give you a real life snapshot of my cutting garden. So what you're looking at is the width of my cutting garden, that 45 foot wide space that I mentioned just a little bit ago. Now the rows or the garden beds, they run perpendicular to that width. Realize that this is simply a snapshot of the garden. So you're obviously not seeing the entire 250 foot length of the garden, but I've included arrows on the left hand side of the screen to help orientate you. Now, when I say three foot wide garden beds, I'll pop some more arrows on the screen to show you what I'm really talking about. Simply put, each bed that you're looking at here is three foot wide. 
Now, I don't want to be too repetitive, but here's one more angle to help you understand. Again, this shot shows the width of my entire garden. In each of those rows within the garden is three foot wide. The width of your pathways too, that's really a matter of personal choice. I will say that in my experience, garden pathways should be at minimum two foot wide. And I know the temptation. When you're in the beginning of your flower growing season and you're looking at these baby seedlings, two feet is going to feel like a lot of real estate. You're gonna look at your garden beds and you're going to look at your garden pathways and think that you can shrink your pathways down to make more room for more flowers. Remember, your flowers will put on a lot of growth in the course of a single season. And as they fill out, they will start encroaching on your pathways despite your best efforts to corral and stake your plants. By the end of the growing season, even the best kept gardens start to look and feel a bit like a jungle. That two foot pathway will shrink down quite a bit. Over the years, I've actually increased the size of my own pathways to three foot wide because I used to get so frustrated by not being able to navigate my garden space late in the season when I was using those two foot wide paths. So now that you have the measurements of the perimeter of your growing space and you've thought through what the size of the flower beds that you'd like to use within your space, now it's just a bit of plug and play. You know, it's sort of a game of Tetris to really see how many flower beds will fit within your space. By this point, this is what I'm currently working with. I can fit seven three foot wide flower beds lengthwise in my garden while still maintaining three foot wide pathways on either side of those beds. Now, to be clear, I do add additional pathways perpendicular to my garden beds, and this allows me to navigate my garden much easier. If I need to access a neighboring row, these shorter pathways keep me from having to walk, you know, all the way around, and it's a simple time saver. So I've shown you a bird's eye view of what my garden layout looks like. But again, I want to emphasize that your garden layout may look entirely different than mine. Maybe you want fewer flower beds and wider pathways so you can fit a golf cart close to your beds. Or maybe you want space for a gardening shed so all your tools are nearby. Ultimately, your garden will best serve you when you prioritize your specific needs. So don't be afraid to do the opposite of what everyone else is doing. Your garden layout really has to make sense for you. So now comes the fun part, actually filling your flower beds. Most flowers that are grown for cut flower production are considered annuals, meaning that they grow for just one season and then typically die back with the onset of freezing weather in the fall. Annuals make great cut flowers because they are relatively inexpensive. You don't have to spend a lot of money to get started. They also grow quickly, especially compared to perennials that may take multiple years to mature, so you get to enjoy your flowers right away and there are a lot of different varieties to choose from, so no matter what your personal tastes and preferences are, you'll be sure to find something that you love. Another great thing about annuals is that you can space them really close together, which means that you can fit a lot in a tiny space. You see annuals, because of their short life cycle, they often require much less space than was typical of the mature perennials that you're likely more familiar with. Now, the specific flower varieties that you choose to include in your cutting garden will largely depend on the unique goals that you have for your garden. The great thing about being in charge of your flower garden is that you get to make the rules. So if your goal is to have flowers for market bouquets, you're likely going to want to plant a good mix of focal flowers, you know, think zinnias and sunflowers. Mix that with fresh greens like basil. And of course you want to leave a little bit of room for some whimsy, so maybe you grow some cosmos. On the other hand, if your goal is designed for weddings or other events, well, you may choose to grow the same flower varieties, but maybe in more pastel tones. And if your goal is to grow flowers for your own personal enjoyment, well, the great thing about that is that you can grow quite literally whatever you want. I can't stress enough, when you're just starting out, the one thing that's more important than selecting the right flowers to grow is just getting some experience under your belt. I remember planning for my first flower garden, wanting to plant the perfect mix of flowers so that I could create beautiful bouquet combinations all summer long. And I stressed over the minute details, like if I plant six plants of this variety of zinnia, another three plants of cosmos, well how many stems can I anticipate having each week and how many bouquets will that really translate into? I'm not trying to discourage your ambition, I think these are great questions to think through. 
but there are a lot of variables to consider, some of which you just won't fully understand until you get your hands in the dirt. Looking back, the most important thing for me, and I wish I had recognized and appreciated this more in those early years, but the most important thing for me was to build a foundation of experience that I could then build off of in the seasons that followed. So many of us try and plan for every what if because we want to avoid failure. We want to experience those successes early on. And if there's anything that I've realized these past few years, it's that failures are ultimate learning opportunities that help you discover better outcomes. The reason I know so well what works for me is because I've experienced every which way that doesn't work. So what I want you to do is create a wish list of what you'd like to include in your flower garden. You know, sit down with your favorite seed catalog or scroll online and write down everything that speaks to you. Be sure to include the specific variety name, the color, and also the price of the seed packet that you intend to buy. Making sure your flower list stays within your budget is one of the best ways to keep your wish list from getting out of hand. I purchased the bulk of my seeds from Johnny's Selected Seeds, but there are a lot of great seed companies out there, so don't be afraid to shop around. As I've said multiple times throughout this video, you can't mess this garden plan up. But if you're looking for a bit of guidance of what I consider to be great beginner type cut flowers that are almost fail proof, I'd recommend sticking to easy to grow annuals like zinnias and cosmos and sunflowers. In my opinion, these are great warm season flowers that grow well in nearly every climate and then are pretty forgiving in terms of care. If you're looking for more recommendations on flower varieties that I love and have had great success with, I have many more videos on this channel that go into much greater detail and I'll link those for you in the description box below. Now before you hit purchase on the flower varieties that make your list, you're going to want to do a bit of math to figure out how many of those flowers that you actually have room for, which is the last bit of information that we need in order to fill out our garden layout that we've been working on. If you're unsure of the spacing requirements your plants will need to thrive in your garden this summer, the back of your seed packet or somewhere within the details of the seed catalog, you should be able to find recommended spacing listed. Here at Two Sisters, I like to keep things as simple and uniform as possible, and I utilize three main spacing layouts. For small, single-stemmed or non-branching plants that have an upright growth habit, think single-stemmed sunflowers or lisianthus, I space these flowers just six inches apart. Within my three foot wide garden bed, I can fit six rows of plants utilizing the six inch spacing. Plants are spaced six inches apart down the length of the bed as well. So in a 10 foot long garden bed, we can fit approximately 20 plants within each of those six rows. The bed itself will grow a total of 120 plants which is pretty good considering we're just talking about 30 square feet right here. Now, if you learn better from real world examples, here's a short clip of what six inch spacing looks like in our garden. Now, next up, for branching flower varieties that need a bit more space to grow, I utilize a nine inch spacing. Flowers that I commonly plant with nine inches of space include zinnias, snapdragons, basil, globe amaranth, status, and straw flower, to name a few. Here's a diagram to show you what nine inch spacing looks like for me in my garden. Because plants require nine inches of space on either side of them, we have room for four rows within our three foot wide bed. Now down the length of a 10 foot row, we can fit about 13 plants, which then means that this 30 square foot cutting garden can fit about 52 total plants. The largest spacing I plant with is 12 inch spacing, and this is for plants that are bulkier and that have a tendency to really spread out as they grow. Amaranth, Celosia, marigolds, dahlias, and cosmos are flower varieties that I commonly plant with this 12 inch spacing. For you visual people, this is what 12 inch spacing looks like for me. This larger plant spacing allows for about 10 plants within each of those three rows, which means we have enough space to grow about 30 plants within this garden bed. So how does this information help us to plan our flower beds? Well, I like to place plants that have similar spacing requirements next to one another within my garden. 
This consistency within my individual flower beds means that I can treat each flower bed all the same, which makes it easier on me when trying to complete maintenance tasks like laying drip tape. So use your flower variety wish list and determine how much spacing each individual variety will require. Once you identify which spacings you'll need to use for your flowers, then scale up or scale down the sample bed layouts that I have shared with you until you fill all your flower beds. Whether you fill just one 3x10 garden bed or dozens, the process is the same. So once more to give you a visual, here's a sample garden layout that I have created. Let's pretend that I've measured the perimeter of my garden, which is 10 foot by 30 foot, and I've decided that I'm going to plant four separate garden beds within my garden space. The two beds at the top of the screen will utilize nine inch spacing because I want to plant one bed of zinnias and another bed of snapdragons. The bottom left garden bed I've mapped out using 12 inch spacing and I'll use that bed to grow celosia. The only bed left is that bottom right hand corner which I plan to use six inch spacing for as I'll plant a bed full of single stemmed sunflowers. As I've said in this video before, I like to keep my garden beds uniform and so I only use one spacing for each of my garden beds within my garden. But if you're growing in just a single garden bed this year, I don't want you to feel limited. So I went ahead and I created this layout, which is that three foot by 10 foot size that I have mentioned several times already. And as you can see here that I've mixed and matched plantings so I can incorporate lots of different flowers within my single bed. I encourage you as you're planning your garden design to get creative and think outside the box. Don't let your perceived limitations keep you from having the cutting garden of your dreams this season. Now when you actually fill in your plant spacing on your layout, you can see how you're left with a map of exactly where your flowers are going to go for the season ahead. And once you're done planting your garden later this season, don't be so quick to discard this garden map. I actually like to keep my maps from each season. As a season progresses, I observe and take notes on what is working, what needs adjusting, and come next season, garden planning becomes just a little bit easier because I'm not starting from scratch. The only other detail we have yet to cover in this video is when you should plant your cutting garden. Warm season annuals, which is what we have focused on within this video, they can't tolerate cold temperatures and they do best with plenty of warmth and sunshine, which means that your growing season will largely be determined by your first and last frost dates. Now you can get a sense for what's normal for your region's climate with a quick Google search. You know, just look up historic first and last frost dates for your zip code. In Michigan, where I live, I'm located in zone 5B, 6A, and my frost-free growing season typically starts May 15th and ends around October 15th, giving me about 150 days of frost-free growing time. Now understand that these are not hard and fast dates and they will fluctuate from season to season. However, knowing your season's key dates will give you something to aim for. If you're like me, you'll learn, probably the hard way, to have patience with starting your garden. Between the chilly air and the cool soil, planting too early can be a death sentence for some heat-loving annuals. And let's face it, there is few things more heartbreaking to a gardener than losing all your seed babies before the season has truly even begun. So once a threat of frost has passed for your geographic area, you're free to direct sow the flowers that you ultimately decided on as you created your garden layout. If you're not sure whether or not you'll enjoy flower gardening, direct seeding your plants directly into the soil once your weather is sufficiently warm. This is a great low risk, budget friendly way to get started. If however, you do wanna get a head start in your growing season, you can always choose to start your seeds inside your home before your last frost date, and then transplant those seedlings into the garden, again once the weather is sufficiently warm. Now every flower variety is different in terms of how long it will take to grow into a proper transplant, but again you can find all the information pertaining to specific flower varieties on the back of each seed packet. The instructions will say something like, Start seeds indoors in trays four to six weeks before last frost. Transplant outside after the danger of frost has passed. Generally, your slow growing stuff can be started 10 to 12 weeks inside prior to your last frost. Your medium paced growers can usually be started eight to 10 weeks before your last frost. 
And then your fast growing flowers like zinnias and cosmos, they don't need a lot of time in their trays at all and they typically take just four to six weeks. Now at the start of this video, I did mention how I'm trying to transform or transition certain parts of our flower garden to include more perennials. Now, if this is a path that you're wanting to go down yourself, then more important than the first and last frost dates of your growing region, you're gonna wanna pay attention specifically to your area's hardiness zone. Your hardiness zone is just an indicator of what can survive the minimum temperatures within your climate. I promise to share more in another video as we get further into the season about the perennials that I'm hoping to include, and I will share how they do in my flower garden. Right now, I'm very much a beginner to perennials in general, so only time will tell how successful they are. Well, there you have it. That is craft planning in a nutshell. Hopefully by breaking this process down into bite-sized pieces, it helps to ease the frustration you may be feeling as you decide what your flower garden is going to look like this summer. Now, once you master the foundational skills of garden design that I've laid out in this video, I encourage you as a next step to familiarize yourself with the concept of succession planting. I actually have an entire video on what succession planting is and how to use it to your benefit, which I'll link for you in the end card in just a moment. Simply put, succession planting is a growing method where you stagger the planting of your flowers in order to achieve a cutting garden that blooms over a longer window of time. I promise it's not nearly as complicated as it sounds, and I'll walk you through it in that video that I promise to link here in just a second. Before I go, I do wanna mention, if you wanna bypass the planning process altogether, you can purchase our quarter acre garden plan in our online shop. You can find the link below. Within that digital download, I share with you the exact layout we use for flowers that we grow here at Two Sisters. I include the specific flower varieties we grow, the layout in which we plant those flowers, I share with you our seed starting schedule, and so much more. A quarter acre of cut flowers is a lot of flowers to grow, but if you are ambitious and have big dreams for your flower garden this season, our garden plan may just help get you there faster. So as we wrap up this video, as always, I would appreciate you letting me know whether or not you enjoyed this content by giving this video a thumbs up. Also consider subscribing if you haven't already, and I can't wait to see you in the next video. Bye guys.